great is the Lord, great is the Lord. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless and honor you. We glorify you. Jesus. Oh, you are so great, Lord. Thank you for your faithful love. Thank, for your, thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to your word. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us because of Jesus Christ. We're so grateful to you, Father. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this house today. We pray that you'd bless us, open our ears to hear and our eyes to see, that we might walk in the fullness of what you promised. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. Turn to two or three people and tell them he is faithful. And you can be seated. Praise the Lord. How many of you brought your Bibles with you today? Awesome. If you have your Bible, let's just hold it up and begin today by thanking God for the gift of his word. Father, we thank you and praise you for the word of God. We thank you that it is alive and it is powerful. And Father, we thank you that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see your word today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to to walk in the full revelation of who we are in Christ and what you've given to us so that, Father, we might win in the fight of life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. You know, before we got into the uh, holidays, we taught some things about Psalm 37 and about how to start your year. But if you remember, we were in our uh, series on the power and authority that God has given to us as members of the body of Christ, his local church. And we were talking about some of the things that we have in Christ Jesus, and we were looking deeply at the subject of faith, how faith is the thing that God's given us to please God. And once you know about the power of faith and you know how to walk in faith, now we have to use our faith to walk in the full revelation of what God has done for us. It takes faith to walk in in the revelation of God, in, in, in the declarations of God. And so today I want to talk to you about something that is absolutely essential to your victory as a believer, as someone who is following Jesus Christ and has accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I believe ignorance of this topic that we're going to look at is the cause of so much heartache in the body of Christ. And it's because we don't fully believe And have faith in what scripture tells us. Either we don't know it, we haven't been taught it, or we simply have not exercised our faith to walk in the revelation of it. You know, there's several things the enemy can do after you become a follower of Jesus to keep you in bondage. One is to keep you in ignorance, to keep you from knowing everything that belongs to you in Christ. To keep you, even though he may you know, allow you to think that you're saved or believe that you're saved, he doesn't want you to know all of the benefits that God has provided for us as believers in Christ. And he wants us to continue to operate out of the old life, the old thinking, the old mindset that we had before we came to Jesus. And you can be a born-again believer with a new heart and still live like the old life because you haven't got the revelation, the truth of what belongs to you. You know, you can have all kinds of things that you receive as an inheritance in God, but if you don't know they're part of your inheritance, then you won't take advantage of them. And so so, very often the enemy keeps us blind to truths. The other thing he tries to do, if he can't keep us from understanding what God has done for us in Christ, he wants to give us uh, doubt and fear that uh, God's promise is really true. He wants to keep us from really walking in that revelation. And so in order for us to, to defeat the enemy as believers, we have to know what God has promised us, and we've got to believe the truths that God has revealed. And of all the truths that God has revealed, there is not any that is more important than the one we're going to talk about today. Failure to fully appreciate what the Bible says about this particular topic guarantees that you're going to walk in what Paul calls the weak and beggarly elements. You're going to walk in your life without the full assurance of victory that belongs to you. In fact, if you don't know this truth, even if you know the promises of God, you will not fully be able to appreciate them because you will be beat up with condemnation. He'll keep you in the bondage of fear that God somehow is going to punish you because of your sins and mistakes. But when you fully accept what God has said about this topic, and you believe that it's true, and you walk in the light of this revelation, it sets you up for victory, listen, 
in this life. And this is the reason we need to understand this truth. Because it's what God has provided for us to live in victory now. Turn to somebody and say, victory today. And what I'm talking about is the incredible gift of righteousness. Everybody say, the gift of righteousness. Let's begin by looking at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and we'll just pick up in verse uh, verse 12. I want you to see what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the condition of the human race as a result of sin. And in verse 12 it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, all mankind in the, in the Greek, all humans, because all have sinned. Turn to somebody and say, through one man, sin entered the world. Now notice what he said. You have one man. That man opened the door to sin for the entire world. And sin opened the door to death. And death then spread to all humanity because all have sinned. This is a very important topic. First of all, let's start with the end of the verse. Romans 5.12. He makes a statement, all have sinned. Now what we're going to look at in the beginning of our message today is God's assessment of the human race. And we need to accept God's diagnosis. Because today, it's very popular uh, to mix other religious ideas and notions, new age concepts, with the promises of the gospel. And I'm going to tell you right now, anything that's mixed into the Bible that isn't from the Bible is going to corrupt your thinking and understanding. The Bible diagnoses the human race perfectly because it's God's diagnosis. And since God made us, he knows how to fix us. And I'm going to accept his diagnosis before I accept anybody else's. Now today, it's very common for people to believe, even people who profess to be Christians, that humans are basically good, that we're born good, but that because of a lack of justice, because of oppression, because of historical issues uh, that have happened through the generations, we learn violence, we have to learn how to hate that These are not the natural conditions of humanity, but that we're born basically good. And what we need to do is learn, uh, is kind of learn about our inherent goodness and walk in that goodness, and then the evil will disappear. And so the the source of evil in this philosophy and humanism is uh, one of the great philosophies that espouse this, is that the appearance of evil in the world is a result of ignorance, that we do bad because we don't know better. And if we knew better, then we wouldn't do bad. We do bad because we've been psychologically trained to do so, conditioned by the world to do bad. But if if we could educate people, and if we could somehow, through some sort of system of governance, maybe government, we could socially a gerrymander humanity, we could control the flow of wealth, we could control the flow of thought. If some great government system could, could rule over us and make it all just and equitable, then the, uh, the evil in the world would disappear because basically no one would want, everybody would be equal, and all would be right with the world. This is the promise of communism. This is the promise of, of what we would call radical socialism. Uh, This is the promise of humanism, which all, if you read them, are very, very similar, and they kind of borrow from each other in their their root thoughts. Man is good, man is ignorant, uh, there's injustice, and we deal with the injustice, man will recognize his goodness, and everything will be okay with the world. Man doesn't really need God. Now, for those who ascribe to a religious kind of this humanism, they would say that man is not only basically good, but ignorant, Man, in fact, is divine, that man is God, that we are all gods in embryo. This is the promise of Scientology, that we were all alien deities that have fallen uh, and lost our knowledge of our true nature as thetans, and that uh, if we could simply get rid of the negative energy through a very expensive process, 
uh, <laughs> called auditing, then we would recognize our true inherent greatness and we would have not only natural powers, we would dominate in this life, we would be as gods in this life. And that's just another, uh, another expression of, of ancient Hinduism and, and even Buddhism, though it doesn't expressly teach a deity, it teaches that we are all part of the one God consciousness, the God mind, and if we get rid of our bad karma, if we get rid of our bad actions, if we get rid of the sense of desire, then we'll all be absorbed eventually through an endless cycle of birth and deaths into the great consciousness, the great mind, and, and so eventually we'll all be as God or God himself, though they wouldn't say there's an actual God in traditional Buddhism. And so it goes, the modern New Age movement and a lot of the new thought movements that we have today talk about the inherent goodness of man, that man basically is a, is a being that is uh, suffering because of ignorance and oppression, and once we know our true divine selves, we know our own inner spirit, we can arise and ascend above and control. There are even people today, many, uh, you can read about some of these, some of these multi-billionaires who have such an idea this humanist concept that they're looking to find ways to get rid of death itself. That somehow if we had the right combination of genetic uh, gerrymandering, the right, the right kind of nutrition, the right kind of uh, magic potion, they wouldn't say magic, but scientific approach, that we could even get rid of aging and death and it would be unnecessary. Now why is humanity so intent on ascribing to itself a condition of inherent goodness? and the possibility that we can ourselves overcome death. Why is that important? The answer is simply because the alternative is unacceptable. The alternative is that there's something wrong with us. And that wrongness is not just physical or intellectual. It goes to the, our core. It is spiritual. And that we have somehow fallen short of our original created design. And that Therefore, we're dependent on something else to save us. This is not a popular thought for man. Today, if you were to go out and say to the, even the average person in the world, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we've all become sick with sin, they would say, well, I sin sometimes, but I'm basically a good person. I do a lot of good deeds. It's not popular for us to think of ourselves as having anything that we cannot in our own strength as the captain of our own ship with our own will and the right combination of energy and self-discipline and education and effort overcome. This is the way of man. But God diagnoses man differently than man diagnoses himself. And I believe God's diagnosis. Anybody who doesn't believe that children are born with a problem called sin either aren't parents or are blind. Because by the time they're three, it becomes very evident that there's something that rebels against what it knows to do right. It's in all of us. And this is what God is saying in the book of Romans and throughout Scripture. Humanity is precious, created by God to walk in fellowship with him, but something has happened to us. Now, with that thought in mind, let's go back and see what God says. Therefore, he said, is through one man, death entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death is spread to all men, because all have sinned. Now, let's go on to verse uh, 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, shall abound to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in, here's a word, justification. Now I'm going to give you this word, it's important, it's a Bible word, and you need to know it. Justification. The word justification is actually a legal term in the ancient Greek world. It means to be made righteous, and I will say guiltless, by a declaration, a legal declaration. So in the court of law, 
the evidence is presented against the, uh, the accused, the defense presents their evidence, and ultimately the judge makes a decision. And when the judge looks at the evidence, the judge either issues a condemnation, a le- this term condemnation in this passage is the legal term of a judge rendering a guilty verdict. He either says you are guilty based on the evidence and therefore you must be punished. But if the judge is convinced based on the defense argument uh, of your righteousness or your right standing, then he issues an order or an edict and he declares the guilty person or the accused person to be justified or made righteous. And once a person is declared righteous in a court of law, that means that they are not guilty of the sin and they are not to be treated according to the accused offense. Whatever the accusation was, now legally, they cannot be treated any differently than someone who never committed the offense. Now here's the problem with you and me. We are guilty. We did commit the offense. Because as we just read, through one man, sin spread to all men and death through sin. Because all have sinned. This is important. All have sinned. The first assessment that God gives to the human race is that all of us are guilty. And I want to show you this. Go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 59. We're just going to take a minute to look at it. And I don't want to stay in the, in, the, um, in the problem, but we do need to accept what God's diagnosis is for the human race if we're going to appreciate the free gift that God has given us. In Isaiah 59, the prophet is assessing God's people, Israel. Now, there were the nations of the world that were involved in all kinds of wicked sacrifices and behaviors, terrible, terrible moral sins in the sight of God. And then there were God's people who had the law and had the prophets, and they were endeavoring to live according to the law. The problem was that God's people, the people of God in the Old Testament were Israel, they kept breaking the law even though God gave them the law. God gave them the law supernaturally. He gave them his provision. He gave them his blessing. He even gave them his spirit in the Ark of the Covenant. He gave them all these gifts and said, now here's the laws. If you keep the laws, you'll be blessed. If you break the laws, you'll be cursed like the rest of the world. But now time had passed, hundreds of years, and Israel, even with the gift of the law, the scriptures, even with the gift of the sacrifices and the presence of God, still was breaking the law. So the prophet Isaiah gives them a diagnosis. And let me just say, if this is true about the people of God, it's true about everyone. Look at what he says. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Heavy means filled. God doesn't have wax in his ears. Uh, God is not, you know, uh, disabled. God has a hand and he can use it. He's got an ear and he can hear. But there's a problem. Verse 2 tells us the problem. But your iniquities have separated you from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. He can hear, but because of our sins, he doesn't hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue has muttered adversity. It gets worse from there. Verse 4. No one calls for justice, nor does anyone plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper's eggs and weave the spider's web. It's deception. And he who eats of their eggs dies and From that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. These are just pictures of people that are so corrupt that they that that vipers spill out of them. Uh, Their webs will not will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Notice that phrase, underline it if you can. Nor will they cover themselves with their works. You see, these people he's talking about humanity. We're broken. We're sinful, and the fact is, we're not good people who are confused. We've got a thing called sin in us, and it causes us to do bad things. And as a result, God doesn't hear our prayers in the way that he wants to to answer them, because our sins are in the way of our once glorious standing with God. 
he goes on to describe it. And he says, and our works won't cover our iniquities. We can't do anything about our problem. Verse 7, their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known. And there's no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths, and whoever takes the way shall not know peace. Everybody say they made for themselves crooked paths. Now notice this, a few verses before, their works will not cover their iniquities. So they're trying to cover their sins with works, but it doesn't work. And here, he said that they make for themselves crooked paths. You see, something's happened to humanity, we know there's a destination we need to get to. There's a compass in every human that points north to our creator. But any path we make to get to where we sense we need to be is a crooked path because crooked people can only make crooked paths. They're not able to arrive at their destination. Now go on and look at verse 9. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness, there's that word, overtake us. We look for light and there's darkness, for brightness, but we walk in blackness. Notice, picture this, it's a person, they know there's light, they know there's something out there, but they can't find it because they're in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. This is God's assessment of humanity. Dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it's far from us. Why? Verse 12, he reminds us what he said in verse 2. For your transgressions are multiplied before you, you being God. Our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. There's that court of law. Our sins are accusing us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, justice is turned back, And here's that word, righteousness stands far off. Righteousness, this thing that we're seeking. We know that we need righteousness, but it stands far off. And even though we're groping for it, trying to find it, making crooked paths and and performing good works, none of them allow us to hit the mark of righteousness. We can't fix it ourselves. This is what the prophet says. But God didn't leave us in this condition. It says in verse 15, second half, then the Lord sought and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. What is he talking about? He's saying God looked at humans. He saw that it was not good. It displeased him. And so God began looking for someone that could fix the problem for man. Now, the thing is, we need to understand the problem. We read about it in our beginning of our service in Romans 5. God said that by one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and that death spread to all men because all have sinned. Say it with me. All have sinned. How did this start? It started with one man. The first man, Adam and his wife Eve the first humans. And since all of us were present in seed form in the first humans, that first man represented the human race. And the scripture tells us in the book of beginnings that God created the heavens and the earth and he called it good. 
And he made from the ground the animals and the plant life, and he set the order of the creation in place. And then he took a scoop of dirt and he made the first humans. And he breathed into Adam the breath of his life. And Adam became a human soul, one who was physically from the earth, but spiritually living by the breath of God, a divine human being, not God, a man, but made just under God, designed to rule over the planet. I want you to get a glimpse into what it was like to be a human before sin entered the world. Go back to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. You're in Isaiah 59. Go back to Psalm 8 very quickly. In this psalm, David, the prophet, describes God's original intention for all of us. Psalm 8. And notice what it says in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You who have set your glory above the heavens. Now he's going to switch from God in the heavens to humanity. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you've ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Notice he talks about the weakest kind of humans, babies and infants, and he says that God made those babies and infants so that out of their lives would come praise and strength, and that he did this because of someone he calls the enemy, the avenger. In other words, humanity in part was made is an act of God to demonstrate something to his enemy. You see, before Adam fell, before Adam was on the earth, God had an enemy. The scripture tells us that God, before he made mankind, made a host of beings called angelic beings. And they were made in different ranks and numbers. And there were three that were in the highest place before God. One was called Gabriel, one was called Michael, and one was called Lucifer. And we don't know much about what happened, but we know this, that there was a war in heaven. Revelation 5 talks about it. Satan said, I will set my throne above the stars of God. He began to want to be in the place of God himself. And the Bible says he deceived a third of the stars of heaven. A third of the angels followed him. And there was a rebellion in that glorious place called heaven. And the Bible tells us that Satan was thrown out of heaven, and he was thrown, according to the prophet Isaiah, to the earth. That means the earth was here when Satan fell. Satan said, I'm going to ascend my throne above the stars of God. God said, oh no, you're not. And he threw out Satan and those other beings that rebelled with him. You see, there was a time when angels had something called free will, just like humans do today. That agency season has ended. And those who rebelled were frozen in their rebellion and sent to the earth And the Bible says that when Satan fell, he made the world a wilderness. We don't know all that happened, but we know that God's enemy was here before Adam walked in the garden. And so when God looked at the earth, and the Bible tells us in Genesis 1, it was without form and void. Those two words, as we've studied before, means to have lost structure and order and to fall into ruin and chaos and destruction. Those are the Hebrew words. Something happened to the earth, and it was thrown into chaos. It was flooded, we find out, and covered with water, and the light was withdrawn. It was an ice planet. And the Bible says that darkness, and the word darkness is the Hebrew word that means moral darkness or wickedness, was on the face of the deep. That Satan was thrown to this earth with those angels that sinned, and he was stuck here in his prison. And then God began to hover over the face of the waters. And God said, now I'm going to do something. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. And the ice melted. And the waters receded. And God said, let dry land appear. And the land came forth. And God said, let the vegetation appear. And vegetation came forth. And God said, let the animals appear. And out of the ground came the animals. And God began to populate this planet with creatures and beasts and beauty. But there was somebody already here. Satan was here. He was locked out of it, but he was here in the spirit realm observing all of it. I, I imagine what it was like for Satan to be on the earth in, in, in his punishment and seeing God create all of this beauty. 
he must have been thinking, what is he up to? What is he up to? And then finally, after he made this whole planet, God took a scoop of dirt and breathed into it his own presence. And he made a little person that God said, now that is my image. That's my likeness. Verse Genesis 1.26, now let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion over all the work of my hands. What must that have been like for the enemy to see this dirt creature now given authority over everything God had created that was his prison? And Satan had no access to it. Satan couldn't control or run anything. And remember, that's his goal, is to run things. Well, in Psalm 8, David tells us how God originally designed us. He said in verse 3, When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man or humanity that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Why are you all, I'll look at everything you made and yet man is your obsession, God. You're always thinking about humanity. You visit us over and over again. Verse 5, for you have made him, that's humanity, a little lower than the angels, and yet crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over all the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, man's feet, humanity's feet. All sheep and oxen, the beast of the field, the the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes through the path of the sea, God has put it under our feet. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. David is meditating on this idea. Look at what God made and yet God's obsession. You know, he, he made the stars and he basically leaves them alone. He made the mountains and he leaves them alone. He made the animals and you know. He, but it's man. He's constantly getting involved with man. He, we're the one that he's mindful of, he's thinking about, he's working on, because we're the ones, through our first parents, Adam and Eve, that opened the door to evil and walked away from God. Something happened when Adam and Eve sinned. You see, Satan was here, but he didn't have access to the planet, so he went to the ones who did have dominion over the planet, Adam and Eve. They had the keys to the earth, and by getting them to submit to his will and violate God's will, they came under the dominion of that fallen angel, Lucifer. And that's why Satan says that he is the God of this age. Jesus called him the prince of this world. Satan stole the authority that God had given man, and now he dominates humanity in darkness and depravity. When Adam and Eve reached for that fruit, whatever it was, to take it, they were saying, what God has made for us is not enough. We need to get something else. We need to reach for something more than what God has given us. It was really the first works, flesh works that had been performed. They're going to do it on their own. And what happened is they lost what they had. The crown of glory that surrounded man left him. Uh, Adam and Eve were literally clothed with light. And that light disappeared and they then knew that they were naked. And, and, and then they had to make clothes for themselves because they weren't carrying God's glory. And most importantly, the right standing they had with God. Think about it. Adam and Eve walked with God. God walked with them on the earth. They weren't God, but they were lords over the planet under the authority of God. They were the objects of his love, his sons and daughters. But when they sinned, something happened. That light left them. That right standing with God departed. And through sin, death entered. God said to Adam and Eve, "In the day that you eat of this tree is the day that you will surely die. And when they ate of that tree, even though they didn't die physically, they did die spiritually. The eternal part of them, the part of them that was made in the image of God, the breath of God in them, was separated from the life of God. And from that time forward, we see humanity now propagating on the earth. And what is happening? Violence and cruelty. And man now is in the dark. He's searching for ways to try to correct and improve himself. And that's the condition of humanity. So when we get to the book of Isaiah chapter 59, and we read about God's assessment of the human race, we have to accept that God knows us better than we know ourselves. 
And even though there are some folks, folks that do better than others and some, some folks seem to respond to God more than others, none of us are able to do enough to fix the problem. We know something is broken. We know something is wrong. We look at ourselves, we see the irreducible complexity of the human brain, the human cell, the human mitochondria, the DNA, and, and, and man's best explanation to get rid of God is that it was a series of cosmic accidents over billions of years that, you know, it just so happened that now we devolved, evolved into this. It would be like going into a planet and setting off dynamite and keep blowing up the trees and blowing up the metal and blowing up the earth, and eventually, if you blew it up enough, you'd have a Corvette. Eventually, by chance, randomly, they would just land in the right places. And the heat would melt the metal and the earth would be separated. That's what you're saying. You see, you look at man and you know we were created. We didn't just come. You look, at, you look at creation and you know there was an intelligent mind behind all this. This isn't just an explosion of chance. And yet in order for man to get rid of God, he has to create a solution that excludes God. So there is no God but what does human say? humanity say? We're God. We're going to fix ourselves. We're going to be able to create the perfect path. We're going to have the right philosophy, the right structure. We're going to have the right, we're going to put together through, our, through all of our human efforts. We're going to perfect the planet. We're going to save it. Listen, we can't. And the problem is we. We have been affected by what our first parents did and it passed on to all of us and we're all born, yes, bearing the image of God, but marred by the sin of humanity. And no one could solve it. God looked for a person that could get back with the first Adam had lost. He couldn't find anyone. He looked for an intercessor and there was no man. But his own arm worked salvation and his own righteousness. God said, listen, I can't find a person on earth who is righteous enough to fix the problem, so I'm going to come. And I'm going, and he, call, he calls him his right arm. This is a prophecy about Jesus. Jesus is the right arm of God coming into the world to fix what we had broken. That's why Jesus isn't just a prophet, he's not just a moral teacher, a good guide. He is. If he is what he said he was, he is the light of the world. He is God made flesh. Then he is not just an option on the smorgasbords of spiritual options. He is the way, the truth, the life. God fixed the human problem one way. And the scripture says he sent Jesus. And here's the thing about Jesus. The only, the only information we have about Jesus, the only information is the information that comes from the documents that were written in his lifetime and after his death in the first centuries. And we have all of them. Go ahead and look at the Roman history books. There's just little pieces. He's mentioned three or four times in secular histories. We know he existed because of his mention. But there's no revelation about him. The only information we have about Jesus is the four Gospels written by the people who saw him and heard him. And they've been preserved for 2,000 years. So if the only source of information about Jesus, and it is the only source that can be trusted, comes from the people that knew him and saw him in the first century, and we have those documents, which all scholars agree they are first century documents. They were written in the lifetime or right after, in the lifetime of the people who knew him and saw him then we need to take what Jesus said recorded by those who knew him and saw him because that's the only information we have. And if you study what Jesus said about himself, you cannot walk away with the conclusion that he was just an enlightened man, a wise sage. Jesus declared that he himself was God in human form. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus declared that he was the light of the world. He was the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He even declared that he was with the Father in the beginning and made all things. These are things that Jesus said. These aren't the words of an enlightened guru. Uh, he's either crazy or he's a liar. Or there's one other alter alternative. He's deceived, he's a deceiver, or he told the truth. And the thing you and I have to come to grips with is this book 
and the words of Jesus are either true or they are not. And if they're true, then we have to believe what he says about himself and about the world and about our condition. I happen to believe that Jesus is truth. And he wants you to as well. God's own arm, that was Jesus, was sent to pay the price for our sin. Now, if we go back to our text in the book of Romans, it says in Romans, again, chapter 5, I want you to look at verse 17. Romans 5, 17. We've got the problem diagnosed. We're broken. We've fallen. What Adam did, he did to all of us, and we've all got that problem. We can't make it straight and fix it ourselves. We can't work our way to perfection. We can't create a path because our paths will be crooked. And there's no one who can represent us to God, so God had to come up with an answer. And this is God's answer, Jesus. Romans 5, 17 says this, For if by one man's offense, that one man is Adam, if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, how much more shall those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus came as the second Adam. Jesus came to do what we could not do ourselves. He's his right arm. God sent Jesus, and this is what's important. Jesus was God the Son, eternally with God, but he took on a human body and a human life, made in our image and likeness, so he could represent us, this is so important, to God as a man, but represent God to us as God. In Jesus is not half man, half God, or a divine man, or a, a God that looks like a man. We have 100% fully human and fully God. God, who didn't need a human body, assumed a human nature, and in Christ they were united. So when you look at Jesus, you, you see God in a body. As man, he represents us to God. But as God, he represents the Father to us. We need Jesus. He's the only one. And he's fully human like we are. Hebrews says that we, in every way that we are tempted, he was tempted. Every pull that you and I feel to righteous, unrighteousness, to wickedness, there's no temptation that you've had that Jesus didn't at one point in his human life feel the pull of. That's why he can have compassion on those who are tempted. He gets it. He gets you. He understands, but he didn't sin. Because his divine nature, he stayed true to God. Hallelujah. And Jesus came, and I want you to get this. Yes, he taught us about the ways of God. He came to teach us. He came to demonstrate the Father so that when we look at Jesus, we can know what God is like. He came to heal the multitudes and, and, and raise the dead and, and, and calm the seas and, 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 and rebuke the wind. He came to cast out demons. All the wonderful things that Jesus did, feed the hungry and multiply the loaves and fishes, all of those things, yes, he did, but he did them on the way to something called the cross. The reason Jesus came was to die. And at the end of his life, he marched up Calvary's hill and he laid himself down on a wooden tree. And he was lifted up between heaven and earth and for three hours he suffered. The scripture tells us that when he was on that cross, that's the reason he came. And on the cross, Jesus was the perfect representative of man before God. Now the question is, why did Jesus suffer? What was the reason? Why did God have to have Jesus suffer? Because you see, our sins require payment. The Bible says, the soul that sins shall die. Death, spiritual death and separation from God is what we have all earned. Not just because we've inherited it from Adam, but because we've all sinned on our own. And by the way, if you think, you know, well, Adam sinned and he got us all in a mess. But if I had been in Adam's shoes, I wouldn't have sinned. The thing is, Adam was the perfect human representative. 
all of us, given that amount of time and freedom, would have fallen short of the glory of God. So God had to send someone that was fully man, but didn't have all the problems that we have. And his answer was Jesus. And as Jesus hung on that cross between heaven and earth, God did more than just show show us his love for us. God actually created a forensic and legal transaction. And just really quick, look back at the book of Isaiah. You're in chapter 59. Go back to chapter 53. Some people call Isaiah the New Testament of the Old Testament because it talks about Jesus all through it. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah tells us, and actually starts in chapter 52 and verse 13, talks about God's Messiah. The prophet saw Jesus, and he describes him in this passage. It tells us that the Messiah was marred more than any man. His visage, his form was scarred. And we know this happened to Jesus when he went to the cross. In verse 1 of chapter 53, it says, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the, here's that word again, the what? Arm of the Lord. Remember in chapter 59, who's going to save humanity? God couldn't find anybody, so God's own arm will work righteousness. Here it is. It says, to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's a metaphor for God's Messiah. Notice it goes on to say, for he shall grow up before him, that's God, as a tender plant. You have he, that's the Messiah, grow up before him, that's God, as a tender plant. That tells us that the Messiah will be born. He'll be born as a child. He'll need to grow. And as a root out of the dry ground, in this context, the dry ground represents Israel, God's covenant people, that even with all that God had given them, could not produce life, could not follow God. So out of that dry ground of religion, the Messiah was born. It says he had no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. We sometimes get this idea that Jesus was this beautiful, cherubic human character that people would look at and and somehow see this beautiful divine being, but The prophet tells us that he doesn't look anything special. He was a Jewish carpenter. He had no special form or beauty that we should desire. It wasn't a physical appearance. Jesus looked like an average man. He looked like you and me. It says that he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. After all that Jesus did, he was rejected. He was despised by the very people that celebrated him on Palm Sunday and said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Six days, or five days later, they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. He was rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. When Jesus hung on that cross, he was despised. Even his own disciples left him. All that remained was John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Martha. It says, surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Everybody say, smitten by God. This is important. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. What that means is, another translation reads it this way, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. That's what it means. There was a punishment that we deserved that was placed on him And because he was punished for us, it brings us peace. And by his stripes, that's a a prophecy about his scourging, we are healed. Verse 6, again, diagnosing us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that's Jesus, what? The iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. 
But he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Notice the next statement. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. He died in a rich man. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Because he'd done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Verse 10 tells us the key. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see, this is God, shall see the travail of his, this is Jesus' soul, and be satisfied. By knowledge, my righteous servant shall, here's that word, justify. What does justify mean? To be made righteous. He shall justify many. For why, how is he going to justify us? How? He'll bear our sins. He'll bear our sins. Or bear our iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, Because, read it, he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Remember we read in Isaiah 59, who is going to, there is no man, he couldn't find a man. Who's going to make intercession? Jesus made intercession for sinners. And here's what you have to recognize and I have to recognize. On that cross, God did something Phenomenal. God made Jesus to die on that cross as a perfectly righteous man. In his humanity, he had never sinned. And even though he didn't deserve to die, we deserve to die for our sins. God, in his wisdom, transferred all of our sins onto Jesus. He bore our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He made intercession by bearing the sins of many. God literally took the sins of the entire human race and placed it on one man. Now the question people sometimes ask is, how could one man's death, no matter how painful and difficult, cover the sins of the entire human race? There are so many sins, right? So much broken law. Well, the answer is simply this, because the man who did it was also God. Because he was infinite in his nature, he had to suffer for a finite period of time. Our sins are infinite, and we would have to suffer for infinity if we had to pay for our own sins. But God sent Jesus for a finite period of time because of the greatness of his being, the suffering had, didn't have to be forever. Aren't you glad? Jesus was so great that he was great enough to cover our sins. Now listen, Jesus didn't die for his own sins. He never stopped being righteous. But he absorbed, and this is what happened. God then took the sin and the guilt of the entire human race, especially those who believe, and he placed them on Jesus as he hung on that cross. And as he hung on that cross, it says he was smitten by God. God poured out his wrath on Jesus. Listen, not because of Jesus' sin, but because of our sin. God punished Jesus in place of us. So much so that one of the last things Jesus said before dying is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Martin Luther, the great reformer said, for a moment in time, the father somehow turned his back on his son, the humanity of Jesus, and Jesus felt what it's like to be cut off from God for the first time in eternity. God had to punish him for us or we have to pay for our sins. And the Bible says that when Jesus died, according to Acts chapter 2, that Jesus descended in Ephesians 4 into the lower parts of the earth, he went to hell. And for a moment, he tasted what that's like to be separated for eternity. But the Bible says God saw the suffering of his soul and was satisfied. And then he took him from judgment. And on the third day, Jesus was snatched out of that grave. Jesus was raised again, victorious over sin. 
He went and suffered for us in our place. He did it so we don't have to suffer. He bore our sins so that we can be forgiven. That's the message of the gospel. That's why believing for Christians, we're really, really big on Jesus. We're really big on believing in Jesus. Our Muslim friends believe in Jesus the prophet, but they deny that Jesus died. They deny that his blood is necessary to cover their sins. When you deny, they deny that Jesus is the son of God. God bless our dear Muslim friends, but I want you to know, when you deny Jesus is the son of God, you deny the only one who can represent you before the father. When you deny the blood of Jesus, you deny the only thing that can forgive you and cleanse you of your sins. There's no other substance in the earth that can make you right with God. There's no other death that can pay the price for your sins. And there's no good deeds you can do that will possibly fix your problem. Jesus did it once for everyone. And the crime that will send a man or woman into a godless eternity is rejecting that act of God on the cross. That's why the Bible says, and Jesus said, he who that has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Thomas said, how will we know where you're going and how will we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Well, that's awfully exclusive. Listen, aren't you glad he made a way? He may not make your way. You know, we want to make our own way and then have God accept it. God says, no, I made a way for everybody. It was my way. And when you hear that message and believe it, God does something. Look in 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Look at what it says. For God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I want to finish this story. This is important. You see, the problem today is that we've allowed human wisdom and religion to get into the Christian message. It started shortly after the church started getting involved in politics in the 5th century. And the church tried to control the world. And the world tried to use the church. And the church fell into a, a morass of confusion. The Bible was taken out of the hands of the people. And instead they got clo- uh, robes and clergy and cloth and candles and religion. The pulpit was moved to the side. The communion table became some elevated sacrifice where Jesus had to die again and again every week. I know my theology. I'm not making this up. It got to the place where the church taught that Jesus died to make it possible for you to be saved. However, you have to work too. So it's what Jesus did plus your good works that will earn you the right to get to heaven. Now, if you're baptized into the system, then if you do some good works and you've got your bad deeds, at the end of your life, they weigh them out. And since most people will have more bad deeds than good deeds and righteous deeds, they go to a place that the church invented in the 6th century called purgatory, which is hell junior. And in purgatory, you burn and suffer a cleansing fire that you pay for the sins that you didn't, uh, you didn't get remitted through your good works when you were alive. And it's suffering, it's painful, and if you've suffered enough, then you can go to heaven eventually. Now, you can get a shortcut on your time on purgatory, the church began to teach, if you pay indulgences to the church to help them build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and the Pope will give you forgiveness of sins. And so Don Tetzel went around Europe with a big, uh, a big sign out that basically said, for adultery, this much money. For, for uh, you know, divorce, this much. You could pay for the forgiveness of sins. The statement was, when another coin in the coffer springs, another soul from, uh, sings, another soul from purgatory springs. 
That was it. And so people, he would go, he would burn his hand under a, a candle and say, your loved ones are burning like that forever. But the Pope in his graciousness has made a way for you to get your loved ones out of purgatory. If you'll pay an indulgence and help build the, the cathedral at St. Peter's Basilica, you will then get time off. The Pope has graciously opened the treasury of merit because there's a few saints who've done more than they needed to to cover their sins and their extra good works are in a big treasure chest in heaven and they're available to you, but you have to do something to get them. And if you pay, then you can get some of that extra merit because the Pope will give you an indulgence. I'm not making this up. But let me just say something. When you're watching television and some healing evangelist says, I've got this green prosperity cloth, and if you make an offering of $500, if you give your best seed of $1,000, and you take this and you lay it on your bank account, you lay it on your, on your wallet, and you dance around it three times and anoint it with oil and send it back to me with your best offering, it's a sale of indulgences. It's the same thing. Charismatics can be just as bad. We're not condemning our dear Catholic friends, and, and, and Catholicism has tried to step away from all of that. But in the 16th century, that's what it was. You're saved by what Jesus did. He made it possible for you to get there. Here you are. But the church began to teach the problem is your unrighteousness, your sins. So when you come to Christ, you get, you get the possibility of getting to heaven, but you have to walk through and pay for your sins through your good works. And, if, and when you die, if you're at the top of the mountain, you go to heaven. If not, you go to this purgatory place where you burn for a while, and then you can get up to heaven. Okay? Now, God did something way better than that. Jesus didn't just make a way for you to work your way to heaven. Jesus performed every work perfectly that you and I couldn't perform. And when you're born again, you don't just get a get-out-of-hell card. You receive the gift of eternal life. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for you. So here's Christ on the cross. Here's you. On the cross, God took all of our sins and laid them on Jesus and took Jesus' righteousness and transfers it to you, that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So when a person is born again, even though we're separated in time and space from Jerusalem in the first century, there's no distance in God. God has one hand on Jesus and one hand on every person that comes to faith in Christ throughout history. And in that moment, he transfers all of your sins to Jesus and calls them paid and then takes his perfect righteousness and transfers it to you. And you are made the righteousness of God in Christ. And I want you to know that makes a big difference. Unfortunately, even, even Christian evangelicals today, Christians teach, you know, I'm saved, but I still got to work to become righteous. The problem with that is you. You can't think, you're not going to be able to work enough to get there. What the Bible teaches is that when you're born again, you are now made righteous in Christ. You're there. You are righteous. Now, your body still sins. The Bible says in Romans 7 that sin dwells in your flesh, not in your spirit, but in your flesh. So you get a brand new spirit that's made right with God, but you have the same old body that still has a propensity to sin, and you have the same old thought life, the whole same thought pattern that, that inclines you to sin. But here's the difference. You're not here trying to get rid of this so you can be righteous. You are here the moment you're born again. You are righteous in your spirit. And now you look back at your propensity to sin, the problems in your flesh, and you deal with them not as a sinner trying to be righteous, but as a righteous man, a righteous woman who's born of God, learning to manage your body. It makes all the difference in the world. I'm not looking at righteousness. I'm on the mountain of righteousness because Christ's righteousness has been infused into me. I've been made the righteousness of God. Now I have this treasure, this born-again spirit in this same old body, and yes, that's where my struggle is. That's why when a Christian dies, they don't struggle with sin anymore because you get rid of your body. And all the temptations you have are in your flesh. They're in your body and in your unrenewed mind. You're either tempted or dead.
Amen. Amen. So now when a believer sins, listen, when we do, we stumble, we fall, it's because we forget who we are in Christ and we use our old mind and act in the old ways. And we have to learn new ways to think and new ways to live. And that's how we walk in righteousness. We're not trying to earn something into us. We are recognizing what he's given us and we're working out what he's already placed on the inside. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody and just say, if any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now, come on, let's stand up and shout and give God praise for that right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God did something about our sins? He did something in Christ. The Jesus moment on that cross is what God did, and it's enough. It is enough. Now, there's only two kinds of people in this room right now. People who have believed the message of Jesus and received, notice, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You've received it as a gift. And if you have, now as you learn to walk in righteousness, you will reign in life. So there are folks that are either saved and have righteousness, but maybe struggling to to figure out how to live in your body. And then there are people here that maybe have never been saved. You've never actually accepted what Christ did for you on the cross. You know, you can be baptized in any church, including this one. You can attend a church, but that doesn't make you a Christian. To become a a Christian, a child of God, means you accept what Christ did on the cross for you. Your parents can't do it for you. Your grandmother can't do it for you. Your wife can't do it for you. There comes a point in life where every man, every woman has to make a choice whether they're going to believe that message that Jesus died for their sins or not. And when you believe it, you surrender your life to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm not worthy in my own strength to be your child, but I receive what Christ did for me. And when you do that, God in heaven declares you his righteousness. He transfers your sins to Christ and Christ's righteousness to you, and you become born again. That's the gospel. And we're going to pray right now. Would everybody bow their heads and close their eyes? If you're in this place and you'd say, Pastor John, I need that gift of righteousness. I need to know I'm a Christian. Maybe you've been in a religious expression of Christianity, or maybe you haven't been a Christian at all. You don't even know what it means. Today, I'm here to tell you Jesus paid a price so that you could be a child of God. And your sins and your brokenness are keeping you from the presence that God wants you to have and experience. And if you'll accept God's son, Jesus, and believe on him today, you'll have eternal life, and God will wash your sins away and make you his child. If you're here today and you are a Christian, you know the Lord. Maybe you've been struggling with a religious idea that you can fix it yourself. Maybe you've just given up and walked away into into sin. Listen, I want you to wake up to who you are in Christ. God wants you to come back and walk in fellowship with him. Maybe you were born again, but you're not walking with him. And your sins are going to affect your life as a believer. They're going to keep you from the victory that belongs to you. But today, you can get those sins cleansed by faith in the finished work of Christ. So I want everybody in this house, wherever you are, those who are listening or watching, I want you to lift a hand up towards heaven and just say this to God from your heart. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus was your representative, Father. And I receive him as my representative, He went to the cross for me. He paid for my sins. He shed his blood so that I could be forgiven. I received Jesus as full payment for my sins. I surrender my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Now, Satan, take your hands off my life, off my mind, off my body. In the name of Jesus, I will walk in the righteousness of God. I will reign in life through Jesus Christ. Father, I declare my sins are forgiven. I'm your child. And in Jesus' name, I will learn to walk with you. Now, if you believe it, lift the other hand up and give him a shout of praise as if it's true right now. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Listen, the Bible says to believers, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you just prayed that prayer from your heart, you are forgiven, you are cleansed, you are declared right with God. Your sins are paid for in Christ. Now you can walk free in Jesus' name. I want you to praise him one more time like what I just said is true for you. Come on. Forgiven, blood-bought, blood-washed children of the Most High God. Let's give him a shout. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the great news of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may you walk in the righteousness of God this week and the authority you've been given as a believer in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Make it a great week.